I'm your host, Key. Here's a good friend, Jimmy Fella. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for that to my request. Hey, man. It's, it's, it's an honor to be number 243. Now, for people who want to know what Uncensored is, Uncensored is my way of showing people that even with a warning disability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm capable of turning myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any types of disabilities or warning disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you should never give up or have people label you, and you should prove to them you can stem out to something no matter what. Absolutely. And this is a, this is a cause that's uh, very near and dear to me. My grandma was a double amputee. And uh, she still managed to develop a gambling problem and take us to the racetrack all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I absolutely believe in you and support everything you're doing. So yes, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. It is a half hour, 45 minutes over time. And I just hope you're very talkative. I mean, most of my interviews are really good, but most of the time I'm, I'm like put, uh, poking about them to keep it, <laughs> keep it moving. Good. I like that you're confident in your interviewing skills. You're like the Kanye West of interviewers. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> now, starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? Uh, I mean, my bio is that I am a former New York City cab driver uh, who became a professional stand-up comic. Uh, I wrote a book about driving a cab called Follow That Car that came out last year. And it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can get it as an audio book. Uh, and now, you know, I work the clubs in New York City. Uh, I just taped a one-hour comedy special that's going to air in the fall. And uh, I appear regularly on a show on Fox Business called The Kennedy Show. Uh, I'm on a show on Fox News called Red Eye, another great show. And uh, you can see me uh, on this season of The Jim Gaffigan Show. Uh, but you have to have a very intense focus because I'm on it for like literally like split seconds at a time. All right. Well, so starting off before I ask you the hard hitting questions, so then I pass the show over to you, put you <laughs> in charge. Uh oh. I also saw you were a director. Is that true? Um, I have written uh, and directed uh, a, a couple of pranks. Like I directed a YouTube prank that got 25 million hits. It was called Snakes in a Cab. Um, and that was a that was a prank we put out last year to promote my book. Uh, and what we did is we took a New York City taxi, we drove around with a 14-foot Bur Burmese python on the front seat, and when passengers got in, uh, you know, they gave me an address, I turned on the meter, and once I started to drive, we let the snake go. And then basically the prank is just the best reaction shots uh, that we got to people recognizing the snake coming over the partition or looking him in the face. People really did freak out, uh, but it was over fast, and it was shot in a way that made it look a lot more menacing than it was. <laughs> like, we were very careful, because obviously we can't sell books if somebody gets killed, you know? Right. And I hate snakes, by the way. I should say that, too. <laughs> Not a big snake guy. I mean, I don't hate them. I just don't love holding them. So right. that. Now, it's funny. I want to work for PetSmart. <laughs> and they sell in spiders and snakes. And at first off, those aren't pets, period. No. And I'm like, I'm willing to work with the dogs. And if it doesn't look like I'm hiding behind the camera, I apologize. No, no, it's fine. I just, I, I just wanted you to move over so I could see those posters of the women behind you. <laughs> now, I wanted to work with the cats. I love animals. I love cats. I love dogs. Birds kind of skitter shit out of me, but I'm willing to work with birds. Uh -huh. uh, hamsters, mice, no problems. Okay. And it's like, okay, when can you... And then I, I kind of said, and then, okay, I can start tomorrow, but I don't want to deal with the snakes, spiders. Oh, well, you know, because we sell them, and, hey, you know, you may have to open and do your thing and feed them. I'm fine. You want me to deal with the freaking snakes and spiders? I will wear gloves. No, you know, that's okay. You don't need to wear gloves. We're not poisonous. That's why I don't want to be bitten. Oh, don't do anything stupid. You won't get bitten. It's like, yep, yeah, you're not going to hire me. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's rough. Are the snakes and spiders, are those like the animals they give to the new employees 
uh, because nobody wants to deal with them, like the people with seniority? Is that how it works? I have no idea. Uh, I was just wondering. Because I would imagine at a pet store, there's probably a preferred pet that's like the easy pet to deal with. Right. Because that's how it is at every job. The people that are there a long time figure out what they can get away with and how they can get over. And they probably tried to make you snake guy. Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I agree with you on uh, the snake thing. I had to hold that snake for the prank that we shot. And uh, I, it was terrifying because what happens is a snake, uh, it can contract and expand without you even realizing that it's doing it. So, like, I was holding the snake by, like, the neck and the tail. It was about five feet long. And I was like, oh, I got this. And then all of a sudden the tail was, like, eight feet away. And the head was, like, four feet the other direction. And it was like, all of a sudden I had no control, and it was, like, horrifying, and I ran out of the can. So I get it. I'm not working at PetSmart either. We need to find a new gig. You and me. <laughs> well, if you're interested, I would love to work with you if that's a possibility. Yeah, let's find a gig. We need a project, you and me, man. So far, so good on this, right? Right. <laughs> now, for how many years have you been a taxi driver, former taxi driver, and do you have any funny stories? Wow. Um, I drove a cab full time uh, for two and a half years in New York City. So I really started driving when my wife was pregnant with my son, Lincoln. Um, and that was the winter of 2008. So I started in about January of 08 and drove into 2010, like the spring or summer of 2010, full time. Um, I still have my license, uh, but I'm technically, you know, like a retired or in remission cab driver for like the last four years. Um, so I would say I stopped, yeah, stopped driving full time like halfway through 2010 because uh, I took a writing job uh, writing for a startup uh, called PM Sports. It was a sketch comedy uh, website devoted to sports. So it was kind of like, you know, Funny or Die? Right. It was basically Funny or Die if every video was around sports. And, you know, the startup, uh, they had a huge budget, like a, literally like an endowment from Gillette for like $10 million, like a crazy budget. And uh, I really learned a valuable lesson that I think everyone uh, should know. And that's um, when you go to work for a startup, everything uh, you need to know about whether or not they're going to succeed can be uh, determined by looking at the quality of their office. And what I mean by this is if you walk in and there's like a full court basketball court, a video arcade, a rock wall, a bar, a stripper pole. Those people blew all the startup money on having a good time. The startups that work are when you walk in and it looks like two guys and literally like a bomb has gone off in an unfurnished office and there's just pizza boxes and laptops everywhere. Those are the startups that work because those are the people that are actually working on the product, you know? The places that have, you know, uh, pimps and hoes Monday, you know, dress like a rapper Tuesday, casual Friday, they also have bankruptcy Thursday. <laughs> you, need, you need to find the people that just work and go. And uh, I think the lesson I learned from that startup is they were great people, but they were having a good time. Like somebody gave them money, they bought a huge, like a mega loft in Soho, uh, excuse me, in Chelsea. It was amazing. It was the best, you know, month and a half of my life, but... You know, unfortunately, it was more of a party than it was a production. Yeah, absolutely. And after the show, I do have a couple of ideas for you. Okay, I love it, man. You're the best. And now for the next subject, um, you what made you say yes to being a guest on my talk show? Something new I'm gonna be doing. It's asking the cut. <laughs> I almost said customers. <laughs> acting my guests. What makes you say yes to my request? So what? You mentioned your grandmother was an inspiration. Yes. And uh, uh, no well, question. More, no. More so, more so than that. Uh, and, I, and I think you do, like, I think it's important to say, too, is uh, I actually, I enjoyed interacting with you when you reached out. I pre, you know, obviously, I appreciate being asked. Uh, it's an honor to just be on the show. Uh, but the fact that you're just a cool guy, man. You're a cool guy. And that supersedes any adversity you might be facing in your life, you know, and I think for me anyway, because like my, uh, you know, having a background with like a disabled grandma and, and, you know, other disabilities in my family, you know, I, you, you just people like everybody else, man, and there's good people and there's bad people. I'm sure somewhere out there, there's a disabled person that's a pain in the ass <laughs> and I don't want to get stuck talking to him for an hour and a half. You're cool. I'm happy to be here. So I think to word it well, 
Uh, you have very good interpersonal skills. You should be working in like HR or something like that. No, I work in a, uh, I can't mention the store where I work, but uh -huh. every time I ever ring up a guest or help a guest, I'm always talking to them and it's like, well, you're, you're very talkative. Wow, I am a talk show host. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But, yeah, but, you got that part down, man. You got the, you got the talk part down. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be on here. And um, in your experience, let me ask you this. I mean, you've done 243 episodes. Yes. Wow. Do you have a lot of editing to do? I mean, how does it, what, what goes into putting one of these together? You videotape it and then you just link up the sound and away you go? Yep, it's pretty much wow, easy. It's impressive. Is it amazing to you that, how old are you? 27. I was going to say, I was going to guess mid 20s. Do you remember a time in your life where this technology wasn't so readily available? Or have you always known the world this way? Um, I would say probably the 90s. Yeah. Because I, I can tell you, like, I'm, it's, I'm 38, but this is, like, still pretty mind-blowing to me. Like, all the things and ways we're able to create content and access content. I was watching a Paul McCartney interview, and he was telling me how, like, they would literally be in the studio cutting tape with a razor blade and, like, splicing it together to get the sounds and the feedbacks and the stuff they wanted. And now it's like you could go into GarageBand on your phone and lay down like 400 tracks and backing vocals and anything you want. It's got to be so mind-blowing uh, to people that have been with it all the way through, you know? I think like my, I have a six-year-old kid. I don't think his generation uh, will appreciate just how accessible everything is. Although the way technology works, by the time he's older, they'll probably have a lot of cool stuff that they don't have now. So what do I know? <laughs> just a cab driver. I know nothing. No, you're right. You know, if this was the early 90s, I'd probably be raking in a whole bunch of money. Because, <laughs> you know, you had in the 90s, and you should know, certain people were able to do this, and it wasn't a mass produce for everyone else. That's what it is. It's, it's, the technology is really expensive in the beginning, and then once it gets out there, yeah, it drives down a little bit. And, so, mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I didn't have anything that good to say. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I was going to say, in 2000, my dad was a assistant principal for 46 years, and he always made videos uh, for school. He used to work for, um, well, not work, well, tease over at, what was it, Henry Hudson IS-125. Okay, in the big city. Yes, in the Bronx. Wow. And he used to do video yearbooks. Okay. And I used to copy him, and I used to start out with just taking pictures of the X-Men, Spider-Man, and I would add sound to it. Uh-huh. 2004, I joined the audiovisual department. Uh-huh. And there's a guy named Mr. Roll, okay. uh, who was nice enough to help me mm. learn more of this, and he had a big influence on in my life for that. I, I'm, I'm ever thankful for him. Okay. And... With those two, it was my dad and it was Mr. Earl, I, they really pointed me in the right direction, saying if this is really what you want to do, mm. then you should pursue it. And, you know, when I first started my talk show, uh, my mom was supportive, my, everyone else, my dad and my brothers and whatever, said, oh, your head, you have your head up your ass, you're manipulating people, you're taking advantage of people, you're conning people. Oh, you're not going to get a, um, worry, worry, um, if I had to say it, I apologize. No, it's fine. Take your time. Not going to be where I am today in 243. You have your head up your ass. He, <laughs> he has a link, link, maple leaf talk show. Aww. And now that it's getting around, uh -huh. and I can tell you a funny story. My brother... Um, met this scientist, professional scientist, and a professional doctor. Okay. And until it came up in a conversation, have you ever heard of something called Keith Andrew Network? He, obviously, he knew it was me. He played it off like, no. Uh -huh. No, he said, I really think he's doing a wonderful thing. And until a professional a scientist and doctor said it, then they're like, oh, I, well, I guess he's doing something right. 
<laughs> except, yeah. except for there was one comedian that hates me for whatever reason. Uh -oh. There's uh, Wing Ten, that how I contacted you. Uh -huh. And for the record, Wing Ten adds your contacts to your phone. You can add, um, go to your, if you're on your phone, go to um, privacy. The LinkedIn icon will be there. You click on it. It says, would you like to add your LinkedIn contacts to your phone? Okay. Unless you give out your phone number, you, you don't get it. Okay, I get it. So the email will act like a phone number. Uh -huh. So the email will be, if it comes up, you're able to do FaceTime or Skype. Not Skype, more FaceTime or FaceTime audio. And that's how I got most of my interviews. Okay. And now the secret's out. Now everyone's got a okay. flock to that. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know. It's a, I wouldn't say, I guess, in a way, it's kind of like, wait, what, what would you say? Kind of imposing on people? Or do you think it's kind of like networking? Oh. Let me, first of all, let me say this about what you're doing, and this is a big deal. The way media works now, and it gets consumed, is anybody who says to you, you have like a quote unquote pretend talk show, that speaks to a lack of knowledge of the current media landscape on their part. Because we now have the ability, as you sit here and videotape this on Skype, this can make news everywhere in the world. If we do something interesting or crazy or profound, that's what I learned from shooting that snakes in a cab prank, is two guys walked out into the streets of New York City with a camera on a Saturday morning. And by Monday, I was on 51 talk shows. I mean, it's crazy. 25 million hits, you know, a full page in the New York Post, second page of the Post. I mean, Time Magazine everywhere. And it was crazy because that was the first time that I ever realized how interconnected everything is now so in terms of the legitimacy of your project the legitimacy of your project now is determined uh not by who's broadcasting it or what network is associated with it it's now determined purely by the quality of the content if it's good you're putting in the work and you're and you're uh, churning out a professional product you have a legit show bottom line because everything now is kind of just floating around in the cloud and if stuff is good, people latch onto it and they kind of run with it. Um, so I think, I mean, you know, in fairness, in terms of you getting guests and people asking people to be on your show, every time, whether you're a comic, an author, whatever you are, um, if somebody's asking you to be on the show, if you're smart and you find the people to be professional and easy to work with, you should do it. Because every time you open your mouth in this day and age, you have a chance to make major headlines. Major. If you think of every big news story that's happened in this country in the last year, it's because someone turned on their cell phone and videotaped someone doing something. There was two people having sex, it was somebody getting beat up by a cop, whatever it was that, that got everybody crazy for three weeks. Could be it could have been a volcano erupting. Whatever it was, you know, somebody took a video, uh, Ray Rice, anything like that. Some type of surveillance mechanism uh, was shared with the world and took an incident that otherwise would have normally been kept to itself and confined and turned it into a world news story, you know? And that's why, you know, what you're doing now, man, it's as serious as you take it. If you take it serious, you work hard at it, yeah, you got a legit show, you know? Think of how many people are on an actual TV network that are mailing it in, you know, and don't, for that reason, have a legit show that won't always be around. The nice thing about this day and age is, you know, success and failure is largely determined by the individual in terms of content. And the best thing I can tell you is this. Um, doing stand-up, writing books, you know, I write um, for I, I write for political campaigns, I write screenplays, I do a lot of, uh, I'm the head writer for a national comedy service that provides uh, daily comedy to 200 radio stations. And uh, it's another whole thing we can get into. But what I've found is that in getting to all of these places, the only actual networking I did uh, was making the content good. Somebody once told me that you should do all of your politicking on stage. So if your stage is a talk show, a radio show, a podcast, a book, a stand-up stage, whatever it is, if you just show up, make the content great, and don't be a pain in the ass, you got a shot, man. So anybody who's telling you otherwise, 
it and really the proof that you're not deterred is the fact that we're taping the 243rd episode. That's amazing, man. Good for you. No, I appreciate it. Now, sure. I'm going to pass the show over to you. Was there any subjects you want to talk about? Anything you want to ask me? This is your time, after all. 243. Well, when did you get the idea to do the show? When did you decide you wanted to do the show? Well, I always wanted to do it. Back in high school, I had my own show, the Keith Andrew Power Hour, uh, <laughs> Extreme Tuesday. Or, um, Where did you go to high school? Uh, I went to Monroe Woodbury. Oh, come on, man. That's good living. Is yeah. that by the Woodbury Commons? Yes. So you got buses full of tourists looking for coach bags every day? <laughs> and a lot, of, a lot of cute Asian girls, too. You ain't kidding, man. So here's one for you. Have you ever been down to the Fun Palace, where the mini golf course is and that castle not far from there on Route 17? I heard of it, never gone there. I, uh, I've done stand-up. They have a comedy club there called Jester's. And uh, a great, it's actually, <laughs> oddly enough, it's a great comedy club, but it's also like a roller rink, an arcade, and a mini golf course. Right. So it's like you're standing on stage talking about drugs and telling dick jokes, and then kids are skating by on rollerblades. You feel like a dirtbag. <laughs> you feel like a real lowlife. Uh, but yeah, it's good living up there by you. I actually like it up there a lot. Um, you're on the way. Where you live is on the way to a couple of notorious comedy road gigs. Like, if you get onto Route 17 up there by where you guys are and just stay on it till you give up hope, you get to the Villa Roma, which is in the town of, like, it's by, like, Bethel, by where, like, the original Woodstock was. Do you know what that is? Oh, uh, Beth Hills. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you keep taking 17 forever, you'll get to that field where they had Woodstock and there's the plaque and all that stuff. And then um, if you go, like, another two miles, there's a, a resort called the Villa Roma. Uh, it's like, you know, an Italian vacation resort that's been there since the end, beginning of time. But it really is like a dirty dancing type situation where they're there for the summer and they all know each other and it's very competitive and they bring in a comic on Thursday nights and uh, you go on stage. It's like old school Borscht Belt. There's like a big band playing, a guy in a tuxedo introduces you and then uh, you go on stage and everybody in the audience is in their late hundreds. These are the <laughs> oldest people you'll ever see. Like, when you start talking about the election, they're yelling out words like Lincoln and Washington. Like, those are their candidates. It's crazy. But, uh, yeah, you live in a good spot up there. And did you go to college up there? What did you do after that? Well, to let you know, uh, due to the fact that I've learned disability, yeah. I was given a hard time at that school. Basically, yeah. if you weren't an in-person or if you didn't have money, uh -huh. they basically shit it all over you. Okay. So I got out an IEP, and for people who want to know what an IEP is, that's a local diploma. Uh huh. Basically, you wipe your ass with it because it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so basically, I was pushed along. I wasn't taught anything. I wasn't teach. This is the only thing I'm capable of doing. So I guess I got something out of it. Yeah, you do this well, man. Come on. Yeah, I appreciate Give yourself it. some credit. <laughs> you, know, you know how to hang some posters on the wall of hot chicks? That's true. <laughs> you got well, some skills. The reason I have them hung up on the wall is because I got the chance to meet them. Oh, wow. Good for you. And uh, to answer your question, it's just... Oh, I'm doing the best I can. I was tired of having my learning disability hold me back. Can't go to college. Can't get a good job like you. I can't do this, I can't do that. One day I was like, fuck it. I'm going to show people that even if we weren't in disability, I'm going to turn myself into a perfect example. And I can still match to something. Yes. And at the same time, I'm going to try to do my best to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there. Oh, good for you, man. It's a good thing, man. You, may, you don't realize, but you make a difference in a lot of lives just by will, being willing to show up and do that. So you should be proud of yourself, man. You should a little bit. No, no, uh, no. Uh, go ahead. Is that Pink Floyd? Uh, the Wall. Are you a big? Are you a big music guy? Occasionally. Okay. You have certain certain albums just connect with you, and uh, you come and go. Well, Gabe, I can tell you a funny story. We were visiting my grandparents in Queens, mm -hmm. and my brother, my eldest brother, decided to put uh, headphones on me. Mm -hmm. And says, tell me when the tape is done. And the first song I heard was, uh, I don't re actually remember the songs, but I remember the band. Okay. 
but one of the songs are um, 2112 and Tom Sawyer. Wow. And Russ got me into music. And then from Russ, I got into Queen. Then I got into Iron Maiden, Halloween, Nightwish. So you're some hardcore heavy stuff, man. If it's good, I will listen to it. All right, that's cool. No, that's pretty neat, man. I, uh... You know, everybody likes to say they listen to everything. Like, oh, I listen to everything from, you know, One Direction to the Backstreet Boys. And I'm like, yeah, that's not everything. <laughs> this very narrow gap uh, you've described. But no, man, music is powerful, man. When I drove a cab, I will tell you that most days when you don't want to get out of bed, you really don't feel like doing whatever it is you're doing in life, you're lucky enough to have a song that you really love. And if that, like, you and that song happen to connect that day, you kind of coast through all the bullshit you don't feel like doing because you just keep getting back into that song. Like, I used to have to get up, you know, like, 4 in the morning to go get a taxi. And I would walk down 7th Avenue, you know, 4 in the morning, it'd be raining or snow, whatever it was. You're the only guy out there. It was awful. It was like a really dispiriting place to be. But I'd be, like, into some jam, and I'd be, like, euphoric. I'd be, like, skipping down the road. Literally because I was just happened to be into a song, you know? There's a, you know the song like Search and Destroy by Iggy Pop? It's a crazy stupid song, but I remember one day it was like a snowstorm and I was just walking down 7th Avenue and like literally like running, like leaping, like didn't even feel the ground underneath me because I was just so jacked up on a song. So, I mean, if you're listening to this interview, uh, yeah, man, you got to get into music in some capacity. Because it has like a cathartic skill to like get you through a lot of bullshit. You know, you need those little vices because like the way life works, I think the real challenge to life is everybody's trying to achieve things, but you don't really have that much say in whether or not you achieve them. So if you're smart, the smartest people out there, they kind of fill their day with as much happiness as they can. Because I think the real magic trick to life is like being comfortable in your own skin and just enjoying the ride, you know? Because it's like me and you could create something tomorrow. We could bust our asses. We could make it the greatest thing in the world. We could write uh, the next appetite for destruction. We could write a, a freaking Mozart concerto. We bust our asses, man. But we might get hit by a meteor before anybody hears it. And if we didn't have any fun writing that album, there's no payoff. You dig? The payoff really is a daily thing. You know, load your day up with fun because there's a lot of attainable fun in our lives, man. Whether it's like food or music or TV, whatever the hell it is. If you really focus on the attainable fun, your day-to-day -day life is actually pretty good. You know, The only time we really get miserable is when we're really obsessed with things we don't have. You know, So all I've ever tried to do is be alright at what I do so I like the content. And I don't really kill myself in terms of where I wind up. Meaning, yeah, if someone wanted to make you famous tomorrow and give you a zillion bucks, of course you'd take it. But you can't live your day to day hoping and praying that it happens because you're going to be tormented by the fact that it hasn't and then when it finally does you're going to be the kind of person who just sets yourself up for a new torment you know and that's something I learned driving a cab like uh you know people have said that if you have a good attitude you have a good life you know there's plenty of people that are in penthouses worth billions of dollars that you know jump off the penthouse and kill themselves you know and at the same time You'll find like those old Jamaican women whose hut gets blown down by a hurricane every Tuesday and Thursday, but they're still in a pretty good mood. It's because they have a good attitude, good attitude, good life. I don't know how we turned into life coaches, by the way. We were talking about chicks and rock and roll. Now all of a sudden we, we got a, a lecture series going, you and me. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It's basically, this is how I see my life, and I my family makes fun of me for this. I say to people... Go the extra mile, make a difference in your life. Because when you die, do you want to be remembered as someone who has a lot of money? Or do you want to be remembered as someone who made a difference? No matter how big the, the yeah. deed was or whatever it was, it's the fact you made an impression in someone's life. You yeah. went the extra mile, and you're gonna always going to be remembered for that. So to answer your question, I want to make a difference and have the money. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's funny. Yeah, who cares? Just ride, take the ride. But no, you're making a good point. Um, let me ask you this question. Um, doing, doing this show, 
Did you ever do this as a podcast, or has it always been video centric? Um, I guess in a way it's always been a podcast. Okay. And I tried getting a news outlet, local news, News Twelve, uh -huh. Five Seven. And for people who don't know what Five Seven is, Fox News, Channel Nine, Channel Eleven, um, CNN. I tried newspapers, uh, events, uh -huh. and no one really cares. They said. Oh well, we think what you're doing is terrific, but we're not interested at this time. So I was like, wait, so you rather talk about rape and murder than <laughs> something that it's positive and that can help people? Okay, I, I understand. All right, so I guess we need to change the subject to rape and murder. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get some ratings, man. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You know, the way it works now is. The only thing anyone cares about is whether we're getting the hits, whether we're getting the views. Like you and me could do a video where we're clubbing a baby seal. And if we're getting 10 million hits, someone's going to sponsor it. Someone's going to pay you money for it. Because it really is just driven by the like button, by the hit button. And, uh, but I think the great equalizer is if you keep showing up and doing a great job like you're doing now, and you just keep doing it you will create opportunity for yourself. You know, we don't get to do it at the pace we'd like to do it. You know, we don't get to, ter get to determine when it happens. But like back to what I was saying earlier, if you keep doing great work and you just enjoy your life every day in the meantime, you've already won. You just don't know it. Like you're not getting the trophy, you know, but you're winning every day because you're having fun, you're making great stuff. And when you get older, it's all you're really gonna care about is if you had fun with your youth and if the content you created aged well, you know, the last thing you want to be is like that guy who's done creating content, looks back at a body of work and goes, wow, it all sucked. You know, that's a rough guy to be, man. Cause there right. ain't nothing you can do. It's like fouling out of a basketball game and your team's down nine. You don't want to be in that spot. So I think you got the right approach, man. I would almost like, I'm telling you, I have like a good positive message. I would almost tell you to run for president and have me as your vice. But I don't think I can pass the background check. <laughs> so I'm giving it back to you, man. You got to find a new VP. You can take on Trump. Well, I agree with you. Now we're now wrapping up. I'm going to ask you if you know any funny stories. And then I'll ask you if there's any subjects you want to talk about. But while on the subject, uh -huh. there are a couple of celebrities that I try talking to, especially a couple of professional wrestlers from WWE. Okay. And they're like, what is your audience? What is your demographic? What is your following? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not a freaking cult leader. I don't care about my following. <laughs> and it's like, well, how many hits you gain? How many views? Yeah. Uh, a couple hundred. Come back when you have a couple thousand. I'm like, or you can pay me 1200 And I'm like, oh my God. For Skyping to be for a half hour? No. Uh, a half hour. <laughs> or 40 minutes, I pay $30, 40, 50s plus it. Wait, wait, wait. So I'm not getting my $1,200 check? <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of nerve, pal. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, that's funny, man. I, again, I think you can figure out who's in this for the money and who's in it to be good. Because the people that are in it to be good are usually very easy to deal with. Right. Um, I once met, uh, I was once opening for Jeff Garland from Curb Your Enthusiasm at Caroline's on Broadway, and Larry David was in the green room. And, you know, Larry David's one of my favorite guys in the world. He used to drive a cab, so when he heard in my act that I drove a cab, he became, like, the friendliest human being I've ever met. We talked in the hallway for, like, 20 minutes. Jeff Garland, clearly probably the less talented of the two, was just bitching about the door deal and how much money he made and kicked me and Larry out of the hallway because he wanted to concentrate and it was really telling in that moment that I was like, wow, here's Larry David. He's the best. You know, he wrote Seinfeld. But whatever you think of Jerry, who's great and maybe the best comic of a generation, he's fantastic at what he does. But Larry David had such an enormous impact on the quality of Seinfeld. And you only know that's true because when the show ended, only one of them went on to write another brilliant show. Right. Like, Curb Your Enthusiasm proves that on some level he was the driving force behind the episodic uh, Seinfeld. Um, but I found him to be the nicest, like most agreeable person to work with because he just wanted to be good. He didn't care. He didn't see any value in drama. 
you know, giving people a hard time and causing shit just because he could. Whereas a guy like Garland threw a lot of fits, had a little bit of a temper with people because it was like, that's where he was getting his validation from, was reminding people that they were beneath him. The people that are really good are just more focused on being good and they want to help wherever they can. I mean, that's, you know, something for you to think of too, man. When you got your own talk show in like three years, I don't mean, I don't mean the one that we're doing now that you're doing a great job with. I mean the one that your family approves of, those nice. jackasses. <laughs> <laughs> Still be nice to people. You're nice and agreeable now. Try to stay that way, man. And if you need a driver, you got to hire me. Don't forget, I have a taxi license. No, no question about that. Well, if you're interested, I'd like to hire you as a personal assistant. Hey, there you go, man. Take I'll take time out for my other nine jobs of writing and stand uping and TVing and stuff like that. But yeah, we gotta stay in touch, man. I really enjoyed talking with you. Now, wrapping up, do you have any funny stories you want like to share or any pranks? What do you do? Is there any? What What do you What do you do? You follow music. You follow. Uh, I see you follow uh, pro wrestling on some level. I'm trying to think. I mean, I did a stand-up gig with Mick Foley. Do you know Mick Foley, the yes. wrestler? Have you ever met him? No, but I want to. He is as nice of a human being as you'll ever meet. If you could contact him, and I'm sure I could find his contact information for you, he would do your show. He is as accommodating of a human being as I've ever met. Well, um, a couple of years ago, I was doing a stand-up gig. I got hired by the New York Mets uh, to do a 30th surprise party for Carlos Beltran. He's a Yankee now. But he was a Met center fielder back then. And um, the gig was at a place called Cezanne, uh, which is down um, on Reed Street in Tribeca here in New York City. And uh, when I got to the gig, um, you know, I recognized players coming in. The first guy I recognized was David Wright. And I went over and said hello. Again, really nice guy who wanted you to feel like you were on his level. Like he talked, it was kind of like I said with Larry David. He, was, he, he did everything he could so you wouldn't feel insecure. He wanted you to feel accepted and, and part of the game. And uh, he was great. We talked for like 20 minutes, and I was basically asking him, hey, man, are there any inside jokes I should tell about the team? Is there anything I should say, you know, make fun of the team about? And uh, he joked, and he said, whatever you do, just say it in Spanish because nobody speaks English. <laughs> like, I got nervous, and I laughed, and I walked away. And uh, I went around. I introduced myself to other guys. Um, Santana was on the team at that point. Um, Gary Sheffield oddly was on the team he just hit his, his 500th home run uh, Ryan Church was on the team it was a weird pocket for the Mets like Omar Minaya had just taken over the team um, I'm trying to think of who else was on um, Francisco Rodriguez he beat up his, his like father-in-law that year after a Met game I don't know if you remember that so it was like really Jose Reyes was on the team it was a really interesting group of people and um, when I got on stage uh, the last thing I saw before I went on stage was Mick Foley the wrestler and uh, he walked in, just really polite, because apparently Beltran's like a big wrestling fan, gave everybody a big hug and a high five. He was really nice to me. He was really nice to everybody there. And uh, just as the guy was introducing me, the, the announcer, uh, Mick Foley, goes, what are you doing? What are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm about to do stand-up. And he goes, in English? And I was like, holy shit, David Wright wasn't kidding. And then the announcer's like, Jimmy Fallon, everybody. And I got like a little weird clap, went on stage. I talked for like five minutes. No one understood English. No one. I was doing stand-up for a group of people who, like, actually didn't understand English, like the concentrated uh, majority of the families at that point. Uh, and then there were a couple players, like Carlos Delgado, who did. Um, certainly, like, the David Wrights and Ryan Churches of the world. But I was on stage in front of, like, the whole Met team, like, literally doing, like, spoken word. Like, if it wasn't for Carlos Delgado, like, I might have got beaten with bats. But I got out of there alive because Delgado bailed me out. He had, like, that... You know the kind of one guy in the audience has such a big laugh that makes everybody else come along for the ride? Right. Like, I was telling jokes, and the audience was laughing at Carlos Delgado laughing. That's exactly what, like, like I went, like, one for 22, and Carlos Delgado and Mick Foley were the guys who got me out of it a lot. So your boy Mick Foley, he did a good thing. So if you run into him, remind him of that. <laughs> He's a, the man's a hero. The only funny story, there's a lot of funny stories, but while we're talking about baseball... Uh, I went to two baseball games recently, and um, my brother bought tickets to the game, and he didn't know. He's wondering, oh, we got a real great deal on these. He didn't know that the game was all in Spanish. So, <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> 
So at the time a player comes out, I hold it up, it's so funny. So I can, so I can, so I can, okay, did it once and he did it again and again. And it's like, what the hell is going on? It's uh, to all the Spanish people. It's, oh, it's, and then he did an announcement saying it's tonight's Spanish night. Uh-huh. And um, not saying there's anything wrong with that as far as no, funny. It's just a funny position to be in if you didn't know that. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's the point. That's the point, yeah. And so one in the, in the end, there were a couple of like, uh, even though it was a Spanish game, it was mixed. Uh-huh. So not to sound racist. So one of the guys in the audience stood up and said, Okay, white people, Vinamo Mets. <laughs> <laughs> and the other game... Um, you see, I'm always nervous when they start chanting in a foreign language. Right. Because I don't know what it means. <laughs> I, I want to make sure I'm not calling someone an asshole or saying something horrible. Because like, if you've ever been to a soccer game, like, I haven't, but I always read those stories about all the riots and fistfights that break out at soccer games because they're always chanting, like, X-rated things at each other. <laughs> so, like, with my luck, I'd be the guy that was chanting, like, go fuck yourself, and I didn't know. <laughs> the next thing you know, I'm getting my ass kicked. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, as they say, defense wins championships, man. Sometimes you're better off keeping it under your hat. You were like this one. Uh, we went to, I don't know if you went to this or heard of it, uh, there was a Mets game recently where a- after the concert, after the game, there's a concert of Heart. Uh-huh. Wow, Heart. So there's this guy behind us screaming uh, for the whole time, ladies and gentlemen, tonight it's Heart. And uh, the whole time they were talking, it's like, Barracuda! Barracuda! <laughs> and then they play like 10 songs. And the guy says, if they play Barracuda, the show's over. Don't, no, they don't. They have 50 different songs they can play. <laughs> so every time they stopped and there was like a dead silence, all you heard from an audience was, Barracuda! <laughs> <laughs> and that was you, right? No, that was some, uh, oh, some guy <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> That's really funny. Well, we'll do. We'll have to do a concert, man. You sound like a good hang. No, I appreciate it. Wrapping up, do you have anything you want to say to your fans and listeners? Um, I mean, if you're in New York this weekend and you want to see me do stand-up, uh, I'm going to be at Gotham Comedy Club all weekend on 23rd and 7th. Uh, you can watch me on the Kennedy Show next week on Fox Business. Uh, it airs at 8 o'clock. Uh, I'm also on Red Eye uh, next Wednesday, uh, which is a hot time slot, by the way. That comes on at 3 in the morning. And let's be honest, they don't put just anybody on TV at 3 in the morning. <laughs> you talk about prestigious time slots. But, uh, yeah, I'd love to have you check that out. Uh, buy my book, man. If you like uh, if you like reading at a third grade level, you'll like my book. Uh, I will certainly send you a copy just for the hang. So let's stay in touch on that. Send me your address and I'll send you a copy. Uh, and, yes, uh, plenty of good hooker stories for the kids, whatever you're into. But uh, I really appreciate you having me, man. This was a lot of fun. Let's do it again.